Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about oxidation reactions that afford carboxylic acids. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems that I assigned last lecture. In this first problem, we have this triol, and we treat it with desmartin periodinane. And the interesting problem here is we have three different types of alcohols. We have a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary alcohol. And so what will the product of this reaction be? It'll turn out that we'll actually get the ketone and the aldehyde, but the tertiary alcohol won't be reacted because it can't be oxidized to a carbonyl because it's a tertiary center and it's already fully substituted. Now, there are oxidation reactions that can cleave tertiary alcohols, but we won't get into those today. In the next problem, I ask you to show what reaction occurs with DMSO in the presence of acetic anhydride. And so here we can see the formation of this acyl sulfoxonium with the acetate as a counterion. And so if we compare this to a typical Swern oxidant, the Swern oxidant will have a chloride, where in this case, instead of having a Cl as our leaving group, we have this acetate. And so we can use this reagent, which might be preferable as acetic anhydride is more readily available. You just need to make sure that all of this reacts, otherwise your nucleophile, your alcohol, might just get acetylated instead. And so with that, let's get into today's material, oxidations that afford carboxylic acids. So there's essentially two main strategies that people use, however there's a third that we'll talk about briefly. The first is a Jones oxidation. This uses chromium trioxide as well as sulfuric acid. There are other oxidants that are available that can do this type of transformation, such as uh, potassium permanganate or nitric acid. Um, however, they tend to also do other chemistry to organic molecules, so we tend to avoid them. For example, with nitric acid, we can also do nitrations of rings, uh, etc. And so the Jones oxidation is quite common. Another oxidation that you can see quite often, which is emerging, uh, it's been around for a while, but it's quite a powerful strategy that people are beginning to realize. Now that we have methods to generate aldehydes, it's possible to use this reaction in conjunction with some of those methodologies, and that's the use of uh, sodium chloride in the presence of a weak acid, such as sodium hydrogen phosphate. And so in this case, we also use a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. Now the final method is using Tolan's reagent. Now typically this is an, a qualitative test, so if you want to test whether or not you have an aldehyde in solution, you can treat it with a mixture of silver oxide, ammonia, and sodium hydroxide. And what this will do is this will make a silver mirror on your reaction vessel. However, because this is using a quantitative amount of silver, this typically isn't used as a transformation to get from one product to another, although there are some cases in the literature. If you'd like to find those, you could look them up using SciFinder or something called Reaxis. So let's talk about the Jones oxidation. So the Jones oxidation can form carboxylic acids from primary alcohols and aldehydes. However, Jones reagent will also react with secondary alcohols affording ketones, as shown here. And so in the first, so the one thing I want to highlight is that uh, functional group compatibility, while this, is, this reaction has been done many times for different substrates, there isn't a good summary of which functional groups are tolerated and which aren't. As you can see, sulfuric acid is used, so it's likely that certain functional groups that are acid sensitive would not be well tolerated. However, I was unable to find a good reference for a summary uh, of this reactivity. If you have one, please share it in the comments and I will post, I will um, pin it so that everyone else can see it. Um, the disadvantage of this method is also that it uses chromium, which is toxic, as we talked about in the PCC oxidation last episode. So the mechanism of a Jones oxidation is first chromium trioxide gets protonated by sulfuric acid. That then makes it possible for the hydroxy group to attack the chromium species. Once this uh, chromium has been attacked, it's possible for the chromium to abstract a hydride, which reduces the chromium to a chromium-4 and simultaneously oxidizes the carbon single bond oxygen to an aldehyde. Now, as uh, it's crucial that we want to access the carboxylic acid here, there must be some amount of water present in the solution. So in a PCC oxidation, if you recall, I had highlighted that the solvent must be completely anhydrous. And this is because when an aldehyde is in the presence of water, we get the following reaction where the aldehyde can be hydrated to the geminal diol. This is like a hemiacetal with water. So we just call this a hydrated, acet uh, hyd hydrated aldehyde. And so in the next step, this is essentially the same as the one above. The hydroxy group can attack. The other hydroxy group just sticks around. And then instead of having a hydrogen as our R group here, we have a hydroxy group. Okay, so there's some examples of this reaction in the literature that I'll show you. 
So the first one, we take this interesting compound here, and upon treatment with chromium trioxide and sulfuric acid in acetone, we're afforded with the carboxylic acid in good yield. Another interesting example has this NO containing heterocycle, as well as some other functional groups. And here we're afforded with the product in a somewhat lower but still fair conversion. The next oxidation me method is the picnic oxidation, uh, pinic oxidation rather. And this is a very powerful tool because it's quite chemoselective and because aldehydes have uh, very robust methods for their generation now, such as DMP oxidation, yeah, it's really easy to prepare aldehydes, which wasn't historically the case. So since we can easily prepare aldehydes, now we can also easily prepare carboxylic acids because this chemistry is really robust. So it has excellent chemoselectivity. It tolerates most functional groups. However, thioethers, also known as sulfides, are not well tolerated because they can be oxidized to the sulfoxide or sulfone from hydrogen peroxide. However, because the solution is buffered, we don't have any deprotonated peroxide or not a significant amount. So side reactions such as Bayer-Villager oxidation or 1,4 addition reactions to Michael acceptors isn't usually observed. So the first step of this mechanism is the, hypo, uh, the chloride is protonated by acid, which forms uh, chlorous acid. This is in equilibrium because the acid is a weak acid. It's worth noting that typically sodium hydrogen phosphate is used because it's a weak acid. It has a pKa of around 7. The next step is that the chloride is able to protonate and attack the aldehyde, forming this hemiacetal-like species. It's then able to attack the hydride with the Cl double bond oxygen, able to oxidize the carbon single bond oxygen to a carbon double bond oxygen, and cleaving this oxygen chlorine bond, which reduces the chlorite to chlorous acid, uh, hypochlorous acid rather. And because this hypochlorous acid is a reagent that can do a lot of chemistry, it's necessary to quench it. And so hydrogen peroxide is typically used because hydrogen peroxide can just react with hypochlorous acid to form water, hydrochloric acid, and oxygen. But I want to mention that the oxygen that you generate between the reaction of bleach and hydrogen peroxide is very toxic. So if you ever mix bleach and hydrogen peroxide, you'll generate singlet oxygen, which is highly oxidizing and can like wreck your lungs if you breathe in a like lung full of it. So it's a very dangerous reagent and you have to be careful when you're preparing it. Now, even though it's dangerous, it will still decompose relatively quickly, um, but this is a possible concern. So sometimes these reactions might also be done with something to scavenge any singlet oxygen as well, because it could be quite toxic or it could be damaging to your molecules potentially. And so sometimes people use scavengers such as 2-methyl-2-butene. This will also react with any free chlorine that might form because hypochlorite can also form chlorine. And so here we take this very complex vinyl iodide containing several stereocenters as well as an epoxide. And the only functional group that undergoes any conversion is the carboxylic acid. And this is in 95% yield. It's also worth noting that they also did an in-situ preparation of this aldehyde using a DMP oxidation from the alcohol. And so a 95% yield over two steps is quite impressive for something this complicated. Another interesting example is the treatment of this alcohol, uh, this alcohol containing aldehyde here, where the alcohol remains intact while the carboxylic acid is formed upon the, the aldehyde. So quite a nice methodology, in my opinion. Now the final method worth noting is the Tolan's test. And so as stated earlier, this is mostly an analytical method. This is the type of thing you do to check if the product that you formed happens to be an aldehyde. If you're not sure if it's a ketone or an aldehyde, you can do this as a test if you don't have more complex uh, equipment such as FTIR or NMR. And so the disadvantage is that you have to use a stoichiometric amount of silver. And I'm not going to draw a mechanism for this reaction as silver one is involved and transition metals often undergo much more complex mechanisms than us organic chemists would give them credit for. Uh, I also won't show any examples because this is fairly obscure and I don't want you to get the impression that this is a common transformation. It is for analytical testing, but not for actual synthetic transformations. And so with that, I would like to assign two practice problems. First, show why uh, acetone is unable to go a Jones oxidation. So write out the same mechanism I talked about earlier, but using acetone instead of an aldehyde or an, a primary alcohol, and show what happens uh, when the chromium adds to this. The second question I'd like to assign is, choose an oxidizing agent which will accomplish the following transformation. Which method should you use and why? And so with that, I hope this has been a really useful lecture demonstrating the preparation of carboxylic acids oxidatively. If you have any questions or comments, I'd encourage you to leave them below, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you for listening.